session now. Good morning all, welcome to today's Cancer Healing Journey Talks. Myself, Annie Jones from Community Outreach Team of Zenonco.io and La Hills Cancer. Cancer Healing Journey Talks helps cancer survivors and caregivers to share their journey with vast number of survivors and caregivers who have traveled or been traveling through this journey. This can inspire and motivate them for their faster recovery as well. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Susan McClure. She is a breast cancer survivor. And also, she's a journalist, entrepreneur, patient advocate, public speaker, and uh, she's on a mission to educate people about how our lives are changing and uh, genomics and with genomics and personalized medicine. So welcome, Susan, to today's session. Over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Nice to meet you. That's great. So what type of uh, can you speak a little bit of more about the breast cancer you had and uh, how what stage was it diagnosed? Sure. Um, I was 35 when my cancer was diagnosed the first time. I've had two bouts of breast cancer. Um, I am now 59, going to be 60 in April. And uh, the first diagnosis, I was 35 years old. It had not run in my family or so we thought. We, I was just laying in bed one night and uh, I felt a lump on my right breast. And I, I thought, well, that's odd. I don't remember that ever being there. And I said to my husband, does this seem odd to you? And he said, yes, that does seem odd to you. You should actually go have that checked. And so mm -hmm. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you're too young to have breast cancer. It doesn't happen until much later typically. And you're probably fine but we should probably go ahead and do a sonogram just to check to make sure that it's nothing. And yeah. so he did a sonogram and he said, uh, yeah, round borders, that typically doesn't mean cancer. Cancer typically is more jagged. And again, you're too young for this, so probably nothing, but we should still go ahead and get you in for a mammogram. And so I went in for a mammogram and the tech, they, they said, huh, that's interesting. So now we need to maybe have you go for a biopsy. So I went for a biopsy mm -hmm. and the technician uh, was doing the biopsy and he was, he was going, huh, huh. It's usually not like this, huh? <laughs> so of course I started crying. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a two-year-old at the time and was like, oh, how can this possibly be happening? You know, how oh, yeah. can I be dealing with something like this at such an early age? And so it was the next week that uh, it was indeed diagnosed as breast cancer. So um, how was your emotional state when you go to know that you are diagnosed with cancer? I remember exactly where I was when the call came. I was sitting at my office at work and uh, I had been pestering my gynecologist for results because I was like, it should be back by now. This, di this biopsy stuff should already be back by now. Why don't we have it? I don't want to go this whole weekend without, without knowing. And he called late Friday and told me that I indeed, on the phone, he told me that I did indeed have breast cancer and that I needed to come in first thing after the 4th of July holiday here in the States to uh, talk to him and then, and then be referred to a surgeon. And I just remember feeling the ground beneath, beneath my feet, just slipping away. Like I thought, I thought of my son who was not quite two. I thought of um, just all of the possibilities of his life that I would miss. And I just, I was scared. I was just completely taken aback. Hi. So what all treatment you underwent as a part of the cancer? Well, okay. So this is a good question because this was back in 1997. And so mm -hmm. we weren't doing a whole lot of testing of the tumors and finding out what the, you know, what was going on uh, with each of them to drive treatment options. We, there was just this standard of care for breast cancer that I, you know, they said, okay, you are estrogen receptor negative, you are progesterone mm -hmm. receptor negative. So 
we are going to, you know, hormones are not feeding your cancer. So we're going to put you on this standard of care, which was adriamycin and cytoxin. Um, they call, mm -hmm. they call adriamycin, the, the nickname is the red devil <laughs> because it makes you feel absolutely horrible. Uh, so I was, okay. I was given that little cocktail and then I had, I had, I think, I think at four, three or four rounds of chemotherapy. And then I did 36 rounds of radiation after that. So surgery, chemotherapy, and then radiation. All right. So have you ever thought of going for any alternative treatment like Ayurveda, naturopathy, anything like that? You know, back then, I didn't think to ask about anything. I was just so worried about my son and about, uh, yeah, I, had, I knew nothing about this. Like I said, it didn't run in my family or anything. And so it wasn't until years later, actually, um, I had I had finished treatment and I had said to myself, okay, I'm done with that. I am not going to worry about cancer ever again. I am going to just go forward with my life as if that didn't happen. And as you, I'm sure know, once you have an experience like that, you don't typically go back to anything that you experienced prior. It's just like your life has changed. And so I decided at that point that I needed to help other people who were going through a cancer mm -hmm. diagnosis, uh, learn more about their, uh, their diagnosis so they could be more active in their treatment plans. And so I, I became the publisher of Cure Magazine, which here in the States was a brand new magazine back in 2003. And we, um, the whole point was to educate lay people, everyday people around how their treatment op options were changing and that they needed to take an active role in discussing these things with their doctors. And uh, it wasn't until... I guess it was 2000 and I want to say it was 2006, a very dear friend of mine had exactly the same diagnosis that I had. And okay. uh, they put her on exactly the same treatment plan and she didn't respond like I did. So, and that's when the big light bulb uh, went off and I said, gosh, you know, we can't treat everybody the same. We can't give this standard of care to every single person and expect them to have the same outcome. And so, but here in the States, you all, I think, are way ahead of the game in terms of complementary therapies. And um, that wasn't even a, a glimpse on the radar in 1997 for me in my first, in my first diagnosis. All right. So... How did your family took the news? You know, it's funny. Um, when my, the first diagnosis I had, um, every, it was like, here's, you have an aggressive form of cancer. This is what we're going to do to combat it. And everybody was just like, okay, we're just going to get through this. And this is what it looks like. Um, I will say that uh, my son, again, he was two at the time. And he was at daycare uh, playing with some friends in class and he, he was playing house and he had a little baby in his arms and he said that his mommy's booby was sick and that he got put in a corner and told that he needed to not say a word like that and his mom would be told that he used a bad word in, in um, school. And so I came into the office and I, uh, the, the lady at the daycare said, he used a bad word. He used the word booby and we say breast. Uh, so you need to, I said, so wait a minute, you're telling me that my two-year-old son was actually trying to talk to you about how he was feeling about his mother's breast cancer. And you put him in a corner to talk about, I mean, to, and told him not to talk about it. It's like, you know, that's, that's horrible. And so, but we sat down together, my son and I, and we had this amazing conversation. Um, he told me that he liked me better with hair. Uh, and I told him that uh, my hair would grow back, that I liked me better with hair too, but that it would indeed grow back. Um, and he told me that he wished I wasn't tired all the time. And I told him that uh, my body was, was trying to heal 
and that it mean it meant that I needed to sleep more than normal, but that that was also part of me getting better. So we ended up having this really great conversation about how he was feeling, and um, it was really special. Something I'll always treasure. Yeah, that was really heart touching. And uh, sorry, so like, what was your experience with the doctors and the other medical staff? Well, the first, I guess, you know, I've, like I said, I've had two bouts of cancer. So the first time um, I was just completely naive and I just took the advice that everybody gave me and I just moved along through the system. And thankfully I responded to the treatment that they prescribed. Um, I will say that they kept saying I was too young and there was no support. There was no support for a 35 year old woman um, because all of the focus groups were for older women. They were in the middle of the day on a Tuesday, you know, right in the middle of a work day. And I couldn't, I couldn't go do that. I also didn't feel like there was uh, a group for me because again, I did feel so much younger than most of the people. I was in this weird, this weird uh, box of not being old enough for the old support groups. And then they, they, the young ones were pediatric. So I was in this very weird middle ground with feeling quite alone, quite honestly. So uh, my doctors just kind of rushed me through treatment and said, oh, and in fact, um, they rushed me through treatment to the point that I said at one point, hey, um, I thought you said that my my menstrual cycle would return. And my oncologist said, it still hasn't returned. And I said, no. And he said, huh, well, McClure, we might've fried your ovaries when we did that uh, chemotherapy regimen. So you should just be happy uh, to, to be with the child you have now. You know, you have one child, so just be happy for that one child. <laughs> I was just like, yes. wow. Yeah, it just, I thought cancer has taken my hair. It's taken um, a lot of my energy. I never thought that it would take my fertility. I never was told that it would take my fertility. And so that was a pretty big, a pretty big blow. Right. So did you make any lifestyle changes during or after the cancer treatment? I did. I, um, one of the big things was that I just decided to be front and center for my family more. I, uh, I was doing a lot of traveling with my job and uh, always off and running, uh, doing things to launch magazines or uh, be public speaking here and there. And uh, I started taking jobs that were closer and closer to home so that I could be with my son more. And um, I started eating, you know, a completely different diet and and all of those things and uh, stress meditation I was doing I, and still do some meditation from time to time, not as much as I should, but uh, <laughs> you know, tried to just be more mindful about, about the fact that this isn't a dress rehearsal. I, I would say that that's one thing um, that has really struck me through this whole experience. People my age, like I said, I'm gonna be 60 in April and people are just dreading, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be 60. And for me, it's like, hey, I'm gonna be 60. You know, I am, I am alive. I am celebrating every moment that I have. My son and I are incredibly close. I have a wonderful husband who celebrates every day with me. And so I think there's this wonderful mind shift that happens when you, experience something as devastating as a cancer diagnosis can be. And uh, it gives you um, a sense of purpose uh, to, live, to live your life with so much more intent than you might have if you just felt immortal until you were 60. All right. So um, like what will be your message to the survivors and the caregivers out there? I would, I would say that, you know, back when I was diagnosed the first time, I was completely uh, unaware of how much 
my voice means to uh, this whole process. And I would say that you need to think about your quality of life. You need to think about, um, you know, you're in, you're in charge here. And so you need to say, uh, this is what I want for my life. This is what I want my life to look like. Yes, I want to live, but I don't want to live with these debilitating side effects or with this or that. This whole quality of life thing is very, very important. And I also think treatment options aren't discussed enough. Like there are some mm -hmm. incredible targeted therapies out there that uh, people should be uh, asking about and, and just putting people on the same old, same old type of uh, treatment regimen, just because it, it might have, have worked for some people in the past is a very old model, an old way of looking at things. And I think that we need to be looking at the whole person, not just the uh, kind of like the, the standard of care that works for some people. That's great. So did you join any support group during the cancer journey? Like I said, when I was when I was younger, there there weren't any support groups for people my age, and there weren't there weren't support groups for people uh, who were working, who were my age. <laughs> so things have gotten so much better now with social media, with Facebook pages, with you know there are groups everywhere uh, now that you could join. But back then there there weren't so much. So I had to kind of create my own support group of friends and family who were there to care for me um, during my time. But there are certainly plenty of places that people can go now to get the support that they need for sure. And I would say join them, definitely join them because you think you're alone, you think that you're experiencing this thing that nobody else has experienced, but you're going to find out that there are many people like you. And once you share these stories, you're going to find uh, a lot more courage and a lot more self-confidence to tackle, to tackle what's ahead of you. All right. And what do you think about the various stigmas attached to the cancer uh, in various parts of the world? So, and how much do you think is the importance of awareness to the public? Okay, I didn't understand what you said. I'm so sorry. So, sorry. So um, there are various stigmas regarding various types of cancers all around the world. Uh, so stigmas. what do you think about stigmas. all the, Yeah, stigmas. Stigmas. Yeah. stigmas. Right. So what do you think about the importance of awareness? Oh, my goodness. I think awareness is everything because it... Um, stigmas are based are fear-based for the most part, I feel. Like, I feel like, you know, in certain societies, there's not even a word for cancer because it would conjure up um, very fearful, uh, negative uh, meanings. And so it's like, there's not even a word for it. Well, cancer does occur and it is, it is highly curable if you can, if you catch it early enough. And so you have to know your body, you have to listen to your body and you have to be able to talk to somebody when your body is telling you that something's not right. And to me, that's, that's super empowering. And it's something that each of us should be doing more and more. Um, and so, uh, cancer is not something that you should feel ashamed about. It's something that just happens to people, uh, you know, based on environment, for example, I remember thinking, what what could I have done to cause this? You know, I was 35 years old and I, I just couldn't, I was trying to find a reason, a reason for my cancer. And I asked my oncologist, I said, what caused it? And he said, if we had that answer, I'd be a bajillionaire <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's just, it's, there's no, there's no pinpointing of a cause that says, and, you know, this is exactly why you you got this and you should feel ashamed of yourself. That's just not what this is about. And so just know your body, listen to your body and, and, and then advocate for getting the care you need early. Right. So Susan, one last question will be like, if you have to sum up your whole cancer journey in one sentence, what would that be? Oh my goodness, in one sentence. <laughs> I know that's the toughest question everyone says. 
It's a tough one, you know, but I would say um, my cancer experience has reshaped who I think I am. Um, I feel uh, like before my cancer journey, I uh, maybe questioned myself a lot more, had less self-confidence. And now I feel like, gosh, if you can conquer that, you can conquer anything. And so I feel, uh, I feel that it's kind of been my destiny to pay it forward and to live a life where I'm helping others who come after me in this experience. And I know that's not a single sentence, but um, it's a it's a beautiful thing to be able to walk a walk a path with someone who. Uh, is frightened and who needs a hand and you can help guide them and make them feel comforted during the process and less, less frightened. So I'm, I'm very grateful to have had the experience to have survived the experience so that I could pay it forward. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan, for your valuable time. I'm sure this session really motivates people out there who have traveled or been traveling through cancer. So it was lovely having you here today once again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Stay in touch. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Bye.